And we are live. Hello, everybody out there. Um, first of all, uh, I always ask this same question, even before we get into the conversation, and that is, can you all hear me? This is incredibly important because it's not just visual. Yes, it's voice as well. And you're going to want to hear this today, and I'm going to want to hear what you have to say. So can everybody hear this? Just give me kind of a little uh, yes, yes. I'm just looking for that moment. And by the way, for those of you joining us, or just joining us, this is the Bond Book Club, and we can hear you. That means we're off to the races, folks. That means this is actually happening, which is a good thing. So the Bond Book Club today is, um, it's, it's, I got to tell you, it's one of my favorites. I'm, I'm curious to see if it's going to be one of yours. Everybody on the chat, give me a sense of, you know, yes or no. Yes, you love this book. No, it just kind of makes the grade. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to see that in the chat. Chat's going strong right now. Hello, everybody. I see Mark. I see David West. David West now in Scotland, coming to you strong. We've got Bing James Bond in there. Alex Lamas. We've got Hori Door. We've got Paul Lally. Can't do his Sean Connery here. We got DT UK healthy. I know you're doing healthy stuff, man. We've got Jack Heim. Nick Nicholas Slayton actually took a break from working out to be on this. So, I mean, the list is going on and on. Uh, Shane Mackey, et cetera. Why? It is a who's who in the chat room. Guys, this is going to be fun. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So the Bond Book Club, what is it? Well, this is a very comfortable conversation. And boy, don't we need one this week. You know, it's been an interesting week. You know, no surprise, surprise, maybe for some, we had the delay of No Time to Die. And one of the things that I saw a lot of people say is, you know, how are we going to fill the time between now and eight to nine months from now when we see a movie? Well, it's pretty much going to be exactly how we've been doing it all along, probably since 1962. And that is the Bond community coming together. And a part of coming together means that I am not doing this alone. No, 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 no. We've got to, th this is too big of a shot on your computer or TV of uh, Mr. Zaritsky. No, we've, we've, got to, we've got to invite other people. So I'm going to scour, scour the four corners of the globe to find the best people to help me talk about this today. And by the way, you in the chat room, you're included in this. So let's get on the line, Phil Nobile Jr. Phil, you out there? Oh, what, what the? Hey there. It's like oh. magic. You called? You're, you're like, I dream of Jeannie in an OBT All of Our Brown t-shirt. You rang? Exactly. Master. <clears throat> I'm glad you called. Every horror movie coming out in the spring got moved to the fall, so I have no magazine to put together. So I might as well uh, take part in the book club with you. Now, I, is, that, is that true? Because I've seen lots of video of you putting Fangoria magazine to the front of uh, like Women's Day magazine, like right in the front there for everyone. Where it belongs, yes. And people send me videos of them doing it. And I tried to make it a thing on the internet. It was, uh, you know, we're, we're newly in Barnes and Noble. It took, a, it, it took moving mountains to get back in stores and, and we're back in stores. So I'm very excited about that. So I was, and by the I way, was bragging we, on it. We've got to let people in on this little inside discussion that we're having. But Phil is the editor in chief of Fangoria Magazine, a magazine that many of us uh, have been brought up with. I certainly was. I eagerly awaited that. You know, it was one of these magazines I sort of could, sort of couldn't have in my house because it was so, you know, disruptive. But how long has Fangoria been going on for? Since 1979. And uh, we, uh, we brought it back in 2018 uh, after it went away for about a year and a half. And it's just been reimagined a little bit. It's a little more of a collectible kind of uh, something you put on your shelf as opposed to a, a newsprint uh, rag. Uh, it's going great. And the owners are looking at Starlog for 2021. So yes, and yes. Starlog is where all the bond covers happen. So I'm excited to sort of like stick my toe into that pond as well. That's true. That's true. Well, and, and by the way, don't let this man fool you. He, he knows his James Bond. He's going to help us out a lot in the discussion, but we're, we're going to call another buddy from, from far, far off. Uh, Thomas Crichton from Fleming Never Dies. Hello How there. are you? Very well. Thank you. Very well. Buddy, I really wish you had dressed up today. You look like a uh, It's the best I could do at short notice. <laughs> now, now, Thomas, help us out here because Phil and I are hailing all the way from the beautiful state of Pennsylvania. But um, Thomas, where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from the mainland of China. So where I am, we're about four o'clock in the morning now. And 
Oh, it's a nice peaceful time of day, to be honest. You're Thomas, you're doing the Lord's work by uh, by coming on and helping us today. Amazing. Very happy to be here. Thank you very much. And you've got it. You've got a channel on social media I really enjoy called Fleming Never Dies. That's a hmm. it's a pretty bold title. What does it mean? Well, it's simply that I've been reading Fleming for for many many years, and it seems to be that many other people have. It seems that his creation just carries on and on and on as people are always reading his books and then finding a new take on it. Um, so it does seem to be the character that just never dies. Yeah, well said, well said. And somebody else that's very um, prolific at saying things both in voice and print is our next guest. We're going to call Simon Firth to the table. Simon, how are Hi, you? Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for inviting well, me. Thank you for having me. You, you said a lot of different time zones there. You're, you're calling from <laughs> Windsor, aren't you? I am indeed, yeah, just to the, uh, just to the left of London. And you, you even themed our particular visual, you've got Mr. Connery floating in the back there. Yeah, how about that? Uh, that's just, uh, that just uh, happened. Uh, but yeah, it's a cracking poster. I do love it. I, I love it too. Now, I've got to explain something. Uh, Simon's name probably sounds very familiar. We just did a review, but he's had a book come out. Cote, I'm going to try to say it right. Cote d'Ajour, uh, exploring the James Bond connections in the south of France. And I, as I've said to many people, it's not just uh, a travelogue. It's a journey of a man and his passion with Bond. Would you say that's a good descriptor? Oh, God, honestly, I have to say, I think you put it uh, better than I could myself. And by the way, thank you very much indeed for that amazing uh, review, really, stand up. Well, it was, am it was amazing for me. Um, it, everybody will put some links down below to go check this out. But I feel very fortified, you know, having my three brothers in arms here to talk about this today. So we're going to jump right in. I see in the chat room right now, a lot of people have already said that this is this is a bit of a favorite. We've got Calvin Dyson jumping in here, Tim Hans. Uh, we've got uh, Kamiak. We've got a lot of known favorites. They're all going to be sharing their opinion. But this is a book club. And we tend to share a libation. It doesn't have to be an alcoholic one. Gentlemen, let me, let me show you what I put together today. Because Bond has a stop in Athens, I actually have my Uzo with a legit Uzo glass. So I'm going to pour myself a little bit of Uzo. And I will admit tonight, because this is a very special globetrotting book club, that I am going to start. Gosh, that's so licorice-y. <laughs> Uzo. <laughs> Um, I actually haven't drank Uzo in a while, but it smells amazing. I will toast you shortly. But as a follow-up drink, I'm bookending. Bond ends this book on a double martini. So I've got, mm. that's real frost. That's not uh, makeup like you get in Fangoria. I will be having a double martini or two. We'll see how it goes. But Phil, what are you, what, what are you uh, sipping on tonight? Well, I wanted to keep it Fleming. I wanted to keep it 100, right? So I'm enjoying some coffee out of my Chemex, which, uh, you know, like full affectation. I, I, I jumped into it after reading about it in the book, but I, I love, I love grinding my beans in the morning and, and, and making that fresh cup, you know, just spending a little time, a little contemplative time making that cup of coffee. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a delight every day. Didn't it seem to you that coffee, I think you and I even talked about this coffee seemed to be prevalent in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, e everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, it, and it happened, I think he continues it into Dr. No with the, with the Blue Mountain uh, coffee beans from Jamaica, which, which you can get on Amazon, by the way, uh, oh. and I do. Um, yeah, but he, he's, he's uh, Fleming's in full effect with the autobiographical details in this one, starting with his breakfast, I think, and, it's, and, and the coffee's a big part of it. It is. Thomas, what are, what are we drinking at 4 a.m. in the morning? <laughs> uh, I thought I'd just have a little bit of tea uh, from a little cup I got in the Avrupa Passage, which is the European passage uh, close to Pera in Istanbul, which is where in Fleming State I was staying wow. at the Pera Palace. And you've explained to me that Turkish tea and regular um, uh, English tea, not much difference. Not much difference, no. We'll pass it through <laughs> so then. It's, it's the but coffee it's, that's special. And, and, well, Simon, wait do you see. Simon's bringing it. So Simon, you've got a very unique drink tonight. Right. So what I have here then is, um, let's see if we can get the uh, the light through that. It is a, uh, a trigger finger. And uh, mm -hmm. for those of you, uh, for those of you who have bought the uh, most recent of all of the uh, James Bond cocktail books, I think it's called uh, Shaken. Uh, I think this is one of the drinks that uh, the the mixologist put together uh, for the book, as well as the uh, the Vespers and the the Americanos. But it has become a firm favourite. So it's absolutely gorgeous. So uh, take the book out. Uh, have a go at making it. 
It, it looks amazing. Do you have enough yeah. for uh, a second? Uh, I'm just going to take it easy with this one, to be honest. Good man. Come on. We, we, we want you to be awake by the end of two hours. And by the way, um, Roland Hume, there is a lot of chatter about uh, the different libations here. Uh, Roland is freaking out over your coffee maker, Phil. He says, oh, Phil, that's an amazing oh, wow. coffee maker. Also out of context quote from all this, Phil loves grinding his beans. Hey, put it on the poster. Right. This is this is the audience you you've you've welcomed today into your homes. So guys, we've got to Am start I? out something simple. I always like to start with a foundation, and everybody in the chat room can definitely play along. You know, we're going to be getting into the details of this book, the different characters, the locations, the lifestyle. But overall, as you rounded the corner of this book, and maybe you've read it before, and Simon, let's start with you. What did you think of the book from Russia with Love? Right. Okay. So how long have you got? Uh, so <laughs> I, uh, I've got to put this into context and I think it's kind of important. Uh, so I came into uh, James Bond and uh, my fate was sealed uh, from around 1981. Uh, it was the, the movie Few Eyes Only. I've seen a couple before then, uh, but Few Eyes Only was when uh, things really sort of uh, started to take off. Uh, and I was a voracious reader. Uh, so I picked up all of the uh, uh, source material uh, and, uh, and basically liked them. There were a couple of wobbles I couldn't understand at the beginning why uh, there was not a high speed boat chase in the book Live and Let Die, but we got over those. And I basically reread them again and again and again over the uh, subsequent years, except really for two books. Uh, and those two books were this one uh, from Rush With Love and also The Spy Who Loved Me. And as a, what was I, uh, 15, I think, 15 years old, uh, I, I could not understand why James Bond, the hero, was not present, uh, at least in this book, for the first three-fifths of the book. I think so till chapter it, 11 or something like that. Chapter 11. So it yeah. made it quite difficult to uh, to come back to. Uh, and it was one of those, it was the two books that got left behind, That and the Spy Love Me. Subsequent to your invitation, uh, I reread it and it completely changed. Uh, I actually ended up enjoying the first half more than the second. And I'll I'll leave it at that for now. Wow, that's yeah. impressive and a bold statement. Yeah. Thomas, what about you? Your your overall takeaway of this book? Mm. So this is a book I frequently dip into. It is one of my favorites. Uh, so I often dip into a chapter here or a page there. Something occurs to me, I was thinking about it. Uh, but this is the first time in a long time that I've actually read it cover to cover all the way through. And yeah, for me, it just brought back the love of why I enjoy it so much. I love it. Phil? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I've got, I've got a few additions and uh, I've read this book a few times and I, you know, I want to echo a little bit what Simon said, where the, um, as a movie fan, you somewhat regrettably, uh, when you first dive into Fleming as a cognizant adult, um, you're, you're constantly comparing it to the, the film. Yeah. And so I think for that reason, one of my favorites was Moonraker because there was no reason, there was no comparison point really. It was just a clean av adventure. Whereas this one really does invite those comparisons. But uh, what I enjoyed about this last reread was just the details. The, the, the things, the, the bonds in her life, the things you couldn't find in a movie, right? Bonds in her mm -hmm. life, uh, those, just those chess pieces that are being put together in those first 10 chapters of, of the plan to get Bond. I, I, I loved just sort of hanging out in this book this time. And, it was, uh, and I, didn't, I didn't mind waiting 100 odd pages for, for Bond to show up. So this is, this is strange and maybe wonderful that we're all cut from the same cloth because I remember going into this book and I had read it probably about 15 years ago. So I was in my thirties at that point. And one of the things I do remember was the first third of the book with a lot of description. And I remember kind of opening this book like, all right, David, you know, get a drink, get some Johnny Walker Black, you know, get in a comfortable chair, get a blanket, get through the first third. And it was almost like that. It was like, let me get through the first third. And what I found was I, I wound up loving the first third. I, I thought it had great humor. I loved how he went into the characters. I mean, we're going to get into obviously uh, Red Grant, but I mean, they, he really took his time with this. And I think it is well known, and I believe it's well known, maybe some people don't know this on the chat, that Fleming at this point, you know, when he was writing this in 1956, in Golden Eyes and stayed in Jamaica, uh, he had to push himself pretty hard. I mean, there were many days where, you know, he, he has this whole thing where he, he wants to write 2000 words a day. He would write a couple hundred and then put it down. He was falling 
out of love with bond. And you know what? I'm going to actually say that's to the benefit of us because, and I'm going to read this quote, um, which I, I thought was fascinating. So he actually writes to one of his friends and says, uh, and of course I just lost it because I didn't organize this well. Um, ah, my muse is in a very bad way. He's writing this to Raymond Chandler. My muse is in a very bad way. I'm getting fed up with Bond and it's been very difficult to make him go through his tawdry tricks. And that's why you know he rewrote, as many of you know, he was going to first end this as you know, Tatiana and Bond going on a romantic, you know, interlude. And that was it. And he wound up Bond doing what Bond did at the end of this, which is to be poisoned and kind of left on a cliffhanger. Um, we know he got his, his mojo back for Dr. No, but to me, that falling out of love with Bond helped the first third really come to life in a big way. What do you think? Yeah, the first third is really, uh, they justify what they're going to do and it's kind of interesting they, they justify why would they target this this man and exactly. i think with the level of detail that's happening in there with that that <clears throat> the smirch meeting it's it's very clear that he is enjoying that part of it that he's enjoying just sort of like uh, vomiting out this stuff that he knew about uh you know russian espionage and the details that are happening there are um uh, new, I would say. Like I didn't, I, I, you know, the, 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 his his version of the mafia and diamonds are forever is not a patch on his detailed uh, depiction of Smirsh in this book, and it, it shows that mm. he's just really invested in that part of the book. Yeah, we'll yeah, we'll get. I, oh, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, I I I don't know whether, in fact, the uh, the brilliance of the first third is uh, it's because uh, Ian Fleming was uh, falling out of love with Bond, and I, I I couldn't possibly say, and I dare say, there will be people better people better than me that will know that. But but certainly for me, the uh, the first uh, the first third or so uh, actually uh, reads and plays better uh, than what happens afterwards once uh, Bond enters the picture. Uh, I, in fact, I went straight back to reread uh, the first uh, the first half again. It was brilliant. You know, a lot of people in the chat room are saying that it, it was when they were young, very hard. Uh, Joe Darlington, being James Bond, says, when I was young, it was tough getting through the first third of the book. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things when you do eventually get to Bond, what some people find difficult, and let's debate this, let's talk about this, is it's kind of a different Bond than the previous mm -hmm. books. I mean, people have said that Bond as a character um, there are some great things, like, for example, I love the fact that they focused on his private life, you know, largely around his home, his personal habits, you know, his housekeeper, May. I love those little tidbits into the man, but it also has a bond that's filled with self-doubt and possibly has gotten a little soft. Even when there's uh, turbulence on the plane, you know, he gets a little nervous. I mean, is that bond? Has he gotten soft? When you finally do get to bond... Uh, Phil, what did, what did you think of the, about the portrayal here in this night? <clears throat> uh, Bond having panic attacks on an airplane is the most relatable Bond has ever been to me. I, I, I love when he's just, he gets that dip and he's like, how old is this airplane? And uh, the, that stuff, again, is, that's the things that the movies never have time for, you know, with the exception of maybe the Craig run, which does sort of try to focus on his pathos a little more. Um, so it's just so exciting to be able to read those details of, of his life. But it's so wild to me that he's bored of Bond when I feel like, honestly, this is this is the first Bond adventure. You know, like it's The other ones are sorting out the details and they feel more like detective novels in, in, a, in a way and they feel smaller, right? But this is the first epic Bond story for me uh, that Fleming wrote. So so to me, it's, it's just so wild that, that he had to kind of bottom out on a certain direction that he'd been going in and then kind of refines it by, by injecting, I think what I've read is a lot more autobiographical details in terms of Bond's uh, mood swings and, yeah. and his, his uh, outlook. Well, it, it, it's funny you say this, Phil, because it, it is well regarded as this is the book that really started the tropes. You know, the different, let's call it the, 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 the platform to which all the other Bond books, and you could argue even the movies, um, really take as a spring source and I, I totally agree with you. I mean, maybe maybe in his, you know, cantankerous nature, or maybe it's like any artist, you know, a lot of great artists have angst and they feed in on that angst. And I think this book connected with, with people everywhere, including, as it's well known, JFK. Um, by the way, Bill Koenig, who is a, uh, is, is a walking, talking historian. <clears throat> Bill has 
forgotten more about Fleming than I will ever know if I started studying even right now, uh, says this. And this is interesting because we know JFK picked this in his top 10. Background about JFK and From Russia With Love. When JFK was putting together the list, Pierre Salander, his press secretary, suggested one of the 10 be a popular book. So maybe this was a little bit of a PR thing that, that he liked this, but I still like the legend behind it. But Simon, what did you think about Bond's portrayal here? Uh, well, I just wonder whether, in fact, Ian Fleming was so pissed off with Bond, uh, that was probably why he uh, had him sweating on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> it, it could be, but maybe instead of making him a superhero, to Phil's point, he made him a lot more relatable and therefore people connected with him. See, for me, this is where we go into the second half of the book, and uh, and, and it just didn't play as well as the uh, as the first third. And I've no idea when when you want to talk about this, uh, but um, now and always. Now and always. Okay, then. So, uh, no, I got to think about this a little bit more. Can you want to uh, move on, one? Absolutely, Thomas. <laughs> portrayal of Bond. What do you think? I like it. So the first third of the book really builds up Bond to be some kind of Superman, in the same way you know the previous book he's always won. So I find it interesting that they built him up and built him up. And then when you finally get to him, he's just a man. Yeah, yeah. And it was what was interesting for me, and I'd love to know what the chat room thinks about this. As we get into some of the surround sound characters, um, his allies and even the baddies, what I found were some of them are so developed, you know, like Kieran Bay, obviously, um, and so interesting that maybe it becomes less about Bond and, and it, it lifts up all the other ships. And, and maybe that's some of the issues that people have with the Bond portrayal uh, in the second half. Could be. All right, big question I have for the group. Here we go. This, is, this could be a little fun. Call it a quiz. Who is the main villain of From Russia With Love, the novel? Hmm. Anybody can jump in here. There's no wrong answer. <clears throat> well, you know that rush, the chapter of Smirsh having their meeting and deciding to kill him really reminded me <clears throat> of the, uh, that big boardroom meeting in Octopussy. Uh, you know, and, and I, didn't, I didn't really, until I reread it, appreciate how much Octopussy was leaning into that energy, I think, the, fil the film, right? Um, and it's, it's almost like there is no main villain. The villain is a committee. The villain is this machine, Smirsh, that Bond, in the end of the first book, vowed to, to destroy, right? Um, because they, you know, when we talk about how Bond doesn't show up for a hundred pages, like Red Grant disappears for most of the book. Yes. They spend two or three chapters painting a very vivid picture of him and then he's gone until the yeah. end. And he's like acting as a different, you know, he's doing his own Hillary Bray thing where he's acting like a different person at the end of that book. Um, and Rosa Klebb, who's so vivid. And I think this is, you know, a, to, to Fleming's credit is that these characters are not very prevalent in the story. They show up. He paints an insanely vivid picture of them, of Rosa, of Kronstein, of the, uh, the, the German uh, generals and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then, they're, then they vanish. Then they become background uh, yeah. information. By the so, way, Phil, it, what was interesting and the reason I asked it like that is because before reading this book, I had in my mind who I thought it was. And as I read it, all that it kept coming to me was Rosa Klebb. Rosa yeah. Klebb kept rising to the top like, like awful cream. Uh, now that I read the chat room, people are also saying Rosa Klebb, and I think you you mentioned her as well. She she really, you know, when you think about, and you can't help this, comparing the movie to the book, um, I would have never said Rosa Klebb coming into this, you know, second or third read of this book, but I can really feel it. Mm. It seems but, to me that the Russians have a very, very clear idea of who the enemy is. For the Russians, Bond is the enemy, and it's very specific. But for Bond, it's it's quite non-specific he's not quite sure who the baddie is hmm. he didn't have a oppo which is which is kind of good i know calvin dyson always talks about his favorite bond movies and bond novels are where you know you're slightly ahead of bond so bonds you know just a little out of place and a little uncomfortable by the way rosa Klebb, i was reading this uh, rosa Klebb was actually partly based on an actual colonel colonel ripkinya who was a real life member of the lenin military Poli political academy and Fleming had actually written an article about them in the Sunday Times. So I, I think, Phil, you mentioned this. It always goes back to how this is almost autobiographical. What word mm -hmm. is that, David? That was a sip of Uzu, Uzu, Uzu and I couldn't say that. Um, Uzu is no joke, man. 
this is no joke. No wonder he <laughs> couldn't get off the plane in Athens. Um, but the reality is, is that that's what Fleming does. He uses real life situations to, uh, to write about, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think uh, the uh, Dar Darko Karim, who I think is his, his name in the book, is based on a, a, a gentleman that, that Fleming spent time with when he was covering some Interpol conference in, in, in Istanbul. Uh, and so he's, I, I, again, this is just what I've read secondhand, but you know, he, uh, apparently a lot of what Darko says in the book is, is verbatim things that this guy had said to, to Fleming and he wrote down. And I think the idea of, of leaning into the real, leaning into what he claimed were the, the real uh, details about Smirsch and leaning into his real uh, melancholy, you know, which is where you find Bond at the beginning of the thing where he's like bored, he's got nothing to do. That stuff really just makes the novel pop. And, and he leans into that. It happens again in Doc, Dr. No, and it happened like the beginning of Goldfinger. Goldfinger's not my favorite book, but like that opening where Bond is in the bar moping might be my favorite chapter of all of Fleming. But it, it all comes from him fleshing it out, making it a little more three-dimensional, I think. Yeah. And Simon, as an author, I mean, as, as somebody who has put together thoughts and prose, I mean, I know that you, certainly your book that we mentioned before, is your own retelling in, in, a, in a literal way. But I mean, you can probably see even in this book, the power of Fleming's process of doing that. Oh, let me, <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, the book, uh, again, th again, thank you for the review. Uh, well, it was probably a, a, a conceit and I, it was just, uh, I enjoyed the area uh, so much, so uh, which is why I probably sort of waxed on far too long uh, about that. Um, uh, and so I, I, don't, I don't want to be sort of uh, brought into the same uh, conversation or sentences as someone like, someone like Ian Fleming. In fact, to be honest, there were a couple of times in what I'm writing next where I sort of felt um, in need of actually quoting something that Fleming said and I thought, Gee, was Simon? Do not do that. You're just going to show yourself up. Just hang fire on that. <laughs> You're amongst friends. You can say anything here. <clears throat> Absolutely. But that that was that was a, actually a very British thing to say. Be very almost apologetic and humble. So I appreciate that. <laughs> but but you know what? I, I tell you what. As as you read this book, I know Fleming, for example, and I don't know if many people know this. Fleming was in a very bad train accident. And he, he often saw trains in general as very dangerous. And I think that's why he paints a lot of uh, train situations in his book as uh, a lot of intrigue, mystery, and danger. But he's also took this one and, and he had, um, I believe he had taken a train that was pretty drab, pretty unexciting. Uh, and then on his way back from Turkey, when he had to go there on assignment, uh, took the Orient Express. And it was such a, um, an antithesis, a yin and yang of lifestyle that he had to write about it. Thomas is somebody that lives a lifestyle abroad, um, who's somebody who's been in the, in the Royal Navy um, mm -hmm. and have seen these things. I mean, could you, could you kind of get into his mindset with this? Certainly, and but I also think that when he's on the Orient Express, he must be referencing Murder on the Orient Express. It was written a generation before, and uh, Fleming stayed in the Para Palace Hotel, which is where the Orient Express was written. So I think there's a bit of a bit of a knowing nod there. Um, yeah, I can certainly see. I mean, transport. Yeah, certainly with the navy and so on, you get very aware of the dangers of transport. But also, I don't. I, if you don't enjoy it, you don't carry on. Good point. And by the way, the chat room has has taken on a life of itself, as it does, which is so wonderful. Where they're talking about Ian Fleming's mommy issues. So Simon, <laughs> you you quoting Ian Fleming compared to them talking about mommy issues, I think you're okay. <laughs> what were the mommy issues? Sorry, I'm completely new to that. What's, what's uh, well, being said there? They're talking about kind of um, how some of the women are written and some, you know what, I'd have to go back. Uh, it, the chat is moving so quickly. So I'm picking up, it's almost like a Rorschach test. I'm picking up little moments, but sure enough, it's there. And I will go back and hungrily read that. Um, but since we're on the issues of our discussion of women, we, we need to talk about the femme fatale. Uh, Phil, Tatiana, um, some people say not the strongest Bond woman, Bond girl written. What are your thoughts? It's a, it's a little thin. And, and you know, the, the whole premise sort of uh, hinges on her being uh, someone without a lot of uh, agency, I think, as a contemporary writers might say. She... And she 
you, you know, the film, the film adds this layer of cynicism and, and skepticism onto this Russian plot, whereas the book just takes it all at face value. And, and, and she is like, sh she's, she's legitimately in love with him, like really, really early. If you, if you look at the, the timeline of this thing, you know, having Bond show up a hundred pages in means that this is a pretty lean adventure for Bond, honestly. And it only covers the span of a few days. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you look at like when he lands in Turkey to when he goes to the gypsy camp and when he is finally in his bedroom where Ta Tatiana is there and they're on the train the next day. You know, the movie added all the stuff with the, you know, the embassy and, and, and whatnot and, and meeting on that boat. Um, but between her and Bond, she's in his bed uh, on the first meeting and then they're on the train the next day, which is hilarious to me. Um, she's, and she's so forlorn about whether or not he really loves her or whether he's only interested in the, the specter decoder. Um, so I can't, I can't argue that, that she is not one of the more uh, well-rounded Fleming female characters. Yeah, she seems to be almost a, a foil, a way to, again, take Rosa Klebb up a notch because Rosa Klebb is such a clear description in the way he describes her and even her actions. By the way, uh, to answer people's uh, panelists' questions on the mommy issues, which, by the way, the chat room's driving me crazy. They're saying mummy, like the mummy, like mm, um, that I, I'm, I'm misreading things, but Money Penny is is clearing it up a little bit. Money Penny from the chat room says Fleming's mother's name is Rose. Look at the rose symbolism throughout from Russia with love. And then you also the have first Rose chapter. Cleb. Ah, mm -hmm. yes, very good. So there we go. A little bit of intelligence. And by the way, if we ever have a question about anything, you know, 148 people in the chat room can clear it up for us. Yeah. All good. Um, I just uh, go back to Tanya. Just uh, one moment. No, keep on um, it. Yeah, because uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't know whether a, a character is uh, is is uh, well written or not well written. But I think uh, when um, when Tanya is introduced uh, uh, during sort of eleven or so chapters where uh, all of the protagonists are, are introduced, uh, we are sort of privy to uh, the inner workings of their mind. Um, and and I think once uh, James Bond enters the picture, then we just no longer have that information uh, and. And whether it's true or not that she wasn't uh, well written, the way that we saw her thinking uh, when she was introduced to us, uh, that sounded okay, and it sort of played very well. Uh, but then once she was introduced to uh, De Bond, uh, then it did seem to uh, that she just fell through that open door rather too quickly. But then again, we didn't have uh, any insight into uh, what she was thinking and whether in fact she was falling in love or whether in fact uh, it was all mission. Uh, and so for me, um, even though a uh, hundred years ago when I first read this book and I preferred the uh, the time with with Bond in the uh, in the pages, actually for me it fell apart because we didn't have that uh, that insight uh, in the uh, remainder of the book. Yeah, and to Simon's point, she's sort of just forgotten about after after Red Grant is killed. Like she barely has any lines or dialogue. I think she's she's this she's this thing that he just has to put away at an embassy hotel, and she doesn't factor into the, the climax in any way. And it's another thing that the sort of movie kind of reverse engineered out, out of that uh, situation. You, you know what I felt like? I felt like she was another character in this book that was helping Bond slowly get out of being lethargic because he is, he's, he has a soft life. Uh, Karen Bay is such a colorful character. He brings him, you know, up a level, brings Bond up a level. And then you have Tatiana who, you know, it's written that he's actually nervous when he meets her. And then, you know, there's that kind of excitement and anxiety and, and that brings him up a level. And by the way, thank you, Tim Hands in the chat room for explaining to me, Mr. Ignorant over here, even though I've traveled a, a lot of places, that mummy is the UK version of sure. mommy. Yes. <laughs> I've, I've read too much Fangoria magazine. All I think about <laughs> is bandages. That's right. Apologies. Egyptian animated corpses. Exactly. Just quickly on the, the Bond girl. I think it's interesting that she's kind of an ordinary girl who's caught up in an adventure. So she seems to have a fairly regular, boring office job. And then she gets thrilled at the idea of going on uh, an exotic adventure with this exotic fella. So in many ways, perhaps like a reader, we ourselves may feel that we have rather boring day-to-day -day jobs. And then we get rather excited to read a James Bond novel. Perhaps she stands there for ourselves. All right, so, so Thomas, let's stay on that for a second because my favorite part, people are gonna think I'm crazy. My favorite part of, um, of this book with Tatiana is when they first introduce her and she's in that kind of, you know, one bedroom with one light and she gets two opera tickets and she can go down and get cheap clothing. I love it when Fleming, and quite frankly, the movies, 
stop for a moment and don't go on the big intrigue and big adventure and instead talk about what's happening in everyday lives because it allows me to think about um, something called projection, which <clears throat> is what authors do really well when they allow the readers to put themselves into the book. So I agree. I think there's there's some great moments where they do that. Yeah, I love the the, the backstory of Karen Bay is a, a favorite of mine as well. Um, yeah, it, it's otherwise you have the idea that these characters are permanently fighting and shooting and running around, but it's good to see a bit of their ordinary life, get a bit of a background. But it's a bit of a shock to them. Yeah. Phil, did you have trouble reading this book when you came to Kieran Bay, seeing the movie one and hearing the movie one in your head? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think, I think they're, they're fairly close. I want to just real quick, though, talk about the thing you just talked about, about, the, uh, about how the book stops down. One of my favorite parts on this read was the whole uh, bit of suspense about Kronstein taking three extra minutes to answer the call. And he's like, no, I'm going to win this chess match. And then he had to like think of an excuse. And then he had to like, adds nothing to the book. Ultimately adds nothing to the story rather. But it was such a vivid, cool moment in terms of like the culture we were about to discover about like what these people valued and, and what, how, their, how they had their priorities in terms of like their, their interpersonal dynamics. Love that. Um, no, Karen, Karen was fine on, in this one for me because uh, He's the he's the prototype of that that uh, exotic ally, you know, and you you see why it's such a tempting thing to keep coming back to, whether it's Columbo or the, or those other characters that happen later in the, in the stories. Um, but I'll tell you a little cheat code on this too: is that any anybody in the chat room who maybe hasn't read this book yet, and when you started this whole reading challenge, I was surprised at how many folks hadn't read Fleming. But it, there's a there's a lot of Bond fans that are just movie fans, um, and what a brilliant way to spend spend this delay right Re, you know revisiting these books or visiting for the first time uh just credit to you for this whole idea i think it was very cool uh but having read the book and having to drive around a lot i downloaded off of itunes the audiobook that toby stevens re reads mm. uh, from russia with love and if you're daunted by the, the idea of reading the book it's not a long book uh but if you're driving you're busy the audiobook really brings this to life in, in a lot of ways. And that's, that helped me with all of those Russian characters in Smirsh at the beginning, because he, it's a, it's a quasi performance that he's doing. So you've got a different voice for each person and uh, it helps you figure out how these names are supposed to be pronounced that are uh, more consonants than vowels. Um, but it, it, it created a, a vivid portrait of each character in a way that maybe if I was just flipping the pages, I wouldn't have had. That's a, that's a great way to put it. And by the way, I've got to tell you, when we first started this, I thought for sure it was going to be mostly young people that had never read the Fleming books. Um, and, and that was pretty true. But what I found was um, us older gentlemen with the, the silver gray hair um, had read the books, but not for a long time. Like not like Simon, you were talking, like not since we were like teenagers, maybe or very young adults. And in some ways, I feel like I'm reading them for the first time. So it, it's been an interesting experience. Sorry, is that to me? Well, just uh, I was, I was <laughs> yes. sort of commiserating, sort of uh, uh, connecting with you on that. I mean, uh, God, as a kid, um, uh, I just love the Fleming novels, and 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 I have read a few um, more recently uh, than From Russia to Love. Uh, it would have been difficult to come back to it had it not been for this invitation, but. I sort of went on to a different series of books. Uh, they were written by Leslie Charteris and the, and the Saint. And he was just a guy who had a, a, an amazing love of words. He played with words. The words danced for him. He was absolutely superb. But what Leslie Charteris never had, uh, and this is just a generalization uh, for me, is that, oh my God, the senses just uh, just come to life when you, when you, when you read Fleming. Uh, I can just, yeah. I can taste the, uh, the food. I'm salivating at the drink. It could just be a low brow, but the way in which the, uh, uh, the, uh, the foods and the drinks and things are, are, are described, um, oh my God, you just want to be there. You want to drink it. You want to eat it. Uh, and for me, that is what Fleming always does, has always done very, very well. I absolutely agree. It's interesting too, because it is, I, I always tell people it's a bit of a fight when, you, when you've when you watched the movies and then you go into the books, your first book is going to be that comparison, especially if there's a movie made about it. Um, Tillin, uh, which Bond today in the chat room says, for me, it's so hard to not expect the books to be like the movies. Probably had seen all the movies five times before I even started reading the books. But the more you keep up with it, the more you can appreciate the books on your own. And Simon, you nailed it. To me, it is those lifestyle moments, which I tend to gravitate to. But in this book, 
I was joking with Phil. It was like coffee, coffee, coffee. But um, what I loved about this is, is that there is so many times where there's great descriptors of the way he eats and what he eats. And speaking of that, by the way, I, I finished my uzu, oh. which means it is uh, time for my double martini, ladies and I gentlemen, uh, in actual. Oh, 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 that is icy cold. And, and yes, I am using a Russian standard vodka since it is from Russia with love. None of that uh, made in America stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, <laughs> so cheers to you all. <laughs> but, cheers. One uh, of my favorite lines in the book is where cheers. he compares uh, Raka to Uzo and says they're essentially the same. I thought, my goodness, what an insult to both countries that their national drinks are indistinguishable. <laughs> all right, Thomas, you opened up a can. Uh, let's keep opening it. Tell us the difference between the two. Uh, I'd say that the Turkish one has more aniseed. However, I haven't drunk it too many times. I, I Obviously, I researched this book sufficiently to live in Turkey for seven years, uh, but I haven't had too much raka like many, many Turks. Many Turks, you know, it's, it's a national drink, but they can't stand it, and I can't stand it either. <laughs> <laughs> I much prefer the tea, the coffee, and, and a great many other that, that that's a real thing well let's let's talk about kind of the mistakes of lifestyle and and dovetail a little bit staying with the bad guys we've got to talk about red grant i mean mm. my gosh you know to your point there was such an incredible description um and phil i did think of you because you know as i was reading this you and i had engaged you were going to be a panelist i thought fangoria i thought horror i thought this is like lycanthropy i mean the the the, the, the you know moon gives this guy power. You know, I was thinking about that and I started poking around about uh, <clears throat> the study of serial killers. And uh, obviously there was like H.H. H. Holmes and Jack the Ripper back, back in the, the day. But uh, the, the science of behavioral science didn't really start to become a thing until the late 60s and 70s. Um, with that context, Fleming does a pretty good job of describing a serial killer. Mm. You know, the uh, starting with animals, yeah. Uh, you know, experimenting low, low risk, uh, what, what, what behavioral scientists now call you know, like the lesser than where, you know, serial killers kill prostitutes and whatnot. And, and uh, uh, Red Grant starts with hobos and, and, and the like. Um, and so Fleming got it pretty right. I think the only thing he's wrong about is that he makes Red Grant asexual where, you know, he, he like specifically mm -hmm. says that sort of thing doesn't interest me. Whereas most serial killers are, are driven by, uh, you know, sexual uh urges i think more often than not or sexual uh dysfunctions deviations i just want to show the the illustration in this folio society book of red grant yeah. mm. which is just amazing um but beyond that it's you gotta wonder if fleming knew somebody like that in the military because there is such a detailed biography of red of red grant in the book that <clears throat> it's like it, it just made me sit up you know, it's amazing. M Michael Poplowski has a great uh, quote here in the chat room. He says, uh, Red Grant is sort of the Renfield of murderers. And he has a quote. He goes, I get to kill someone. <laughs> Thank you, master. That's my Peter Laurie. It's not, not great. bad. Not bad. That's all right. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. I love how they went into this. Although I will say, and Simon Firth, I'd like your opinion on this. I will say, I felt like I had two red grants as I read this this time around. I had the one in the beginning, homicidal, you know, this and that. And then I had the one on the train. And it's almost like Fleming backed away from a lot of the setup of, of, of that nature that he had. But Simon, what did you think? Well, I thought, again, the setup, um, uh, the setup was absolutely superb. Uh, he was a truly terrifying character. I, I must admit that I, I didn't go into the research uh, about serial killers. And, um, uh, and, and the one question I, I have for Phil is, uh, was there any connection with the, uh, the full moon? I, I don't know whether that was uh, was in fact a reality. Does that come up in your in your research? I think that's a little bit of a, of a myth about about violent criminals, but they are cyclical. They, they do have down phases. You know, there's a, I, I did a, I produced a documentary about a serial killer in Florida and like every two weeks, like clockwork, he, he would have a cycle where he would calm down and he would ramp up and, okay. and they were finding a dead prostitute, like, like clockwork every, every two weeks in the, in the marshes of Florida. Uh, so that, that, that schedule, I guess, felt authentic. If you, if not quite uh, accurate about the moon. 
Well, I think uh, going back to your question, David, I, uh, I don't know whether he backed off, but I, I think this is one of the this is one of the areas where the uh, the film did actually improve upon uh, the book because the uh, the setup of the the threat uh, was, was was bloody terrifying. Um, uh, and then he disappears, uh, and then he comes back as a, uh, a faux Englishman. So, again, not having again, access to uh, to the uh, um, inner workings of uh, Grant's mind at the point at which he then has to become this faux English person, uh, you, you're kind of left <clears throat> wondering what's going on. But then, of course, we're all uh, reaching for Bond, and we're all in Bond's head right now. So, yeah. it was just one of those things, I think, where the uh, uh, the, the setup uh, didn't have the payoff. Uh, and, but I don't know whether I don't know whether in fact uh, one could then sort of go into the inner workings of uh, so many different players' minds uh, as we go to the uh, denouement uh, well, of, the, of the book. But yeah, it's, uh, it, it did sort of um, not the original times when I was reading this book because it was all about Bond, Bond, Bond then. But but right now with uh, with a few grey hairs and uh, advancing years, uh, it, it it did seem a completely different book for the for that reason. Well, it's interesting. So Simon, you and I, I think, have similar thoughts and we're in good company. There's a gentleman in the chat room, not perfected yet, is his name in the chat room. And if, if I'm if I'm correct, he's, he also does um, the book reviews. He does his own book reviews. They're very well written. I, I tend to read them all. They're fantastic. Um, just before our, our reading challenge comes to life, not perfected yet. Go check him out. Um, but he says, Am I the only one that finds Grant monologuing the evil scheme at the end very out of character for the quiet introvert he is in the early chapter? So it seems like others have observed kind of this, you know, world, world of two Grants, if you will. Well, Thomas, what do you think? Yeah, I can see that. And he's, he's built up at the beginning to be a brute. Um, and then he's kind of put into this rather awkward position of pretending to be someone he's really, really not. We have Bond's impression uh, that it just doesn't work, uh, that he can wear the clothes and say old man a lot, but it really doesn't come across well. Um, so I think that gives him a rather interesting tension of Smersha trying to make him into kind of a high power agent, but he's just not, he's a brute. And that was, uh, I think that was played out at the beginning because uh, from, uh, from memory, uh, that he's, he, he was always uh, just, uh, just a brute, uh, uh, but all of his, um, his uh, education and such like, uh, he, he fell through the floor. And so he's one at the same time being asked to, to play a role, uh, which he's clearly not equipped to do, uh, and then just to, to kill uh, James Bond. Maybe he should have just killed James Bond and not done all the uh, old man stuff. Exactly, exactly. So I've got a question for anybody in the panel that is of British uh, descent, um, because there's a lot of chatter right now about a true British gent would never have red wine with fish, says JB, for example. Uh, is that true? Is that a real thing? Unless it's swordfish, because uh, it's meatier. So you might have white wine you. with a lot of fish, but it's supposed to be paired up well. So it's according to taste. So if you're if you specifically only like red wine, you can drink it whenever you like. But I think a lot of people would have uh, red wine with red meat and then white wine with, uh, with fish. I think it's <laughs> relatively true. true Simon, do you want to fight Thomas over this? Uh, hell, I just think, uh, you know what, uh, to each their own. Um, uh, there, there may be a, a rule uh, or an accepted rule uh, out there, but I, um, I, I have had uh, red wine with fish. It's been a light red wine. It's certainly not been a Gigondo or anything like that. It's, uh, it's a light red wine. Um, or maybe it's just because it's been, uh, it's, it's been open. So I, uh, I, don't, I absolutely have no qualms with, uh, with, uh, with anyone sitting next to me to having uh, red wine with their fish. Well, Phil and I, coming from Pennsylvania, we think you're both Neanderthals. We would never, never. have red wine with fish. <laughs> never. That's, that, that sort of gets amplified in the film as the tell. That's mm. how Bond knows there's something wrong with him. But I love in the novel all the things that you gentlemen were just saying about how they, like Rosa sends red to finishing school kind of, and, and it just doesn't work at all. And Bond immediately is like thinking, I better call his supervisor. I think there's some madness in his eyes. And he's like already ready to snitch on him to the boss. Uh, that stuff was great. And, but to, to me, it felt like Fleming's disdain for uh, the Russian machine. Like that they thought they were clever by doing it, but it was ridiculous that it was like, it was this maniac in a, in a suit that they thought was going to, you know, they were going to prop him up in front of Bond and fool him. And it felt like uh, Fleming sort of taking the piss a bit of uh, Smirsch. 
I, I think you're right. And it is well documented that, um, especially now, and you got to think about, put yourself in Fleming's head just for a moment. I mean, the East-West tensions of the Cold War, um, Fleming was really writing in many cases about his disdain in observing what some people were talking about, the decline of British power. And, you know, this post-war uh, type of situation where some of the luster had come off. And so that's why, you know, there's such so much gravitation back to a more traditional aspect and also, you know, a bit of a, a prose middle finger at, um, at things that are against that. By the way, adorable. This is adorable. So um, in my research, uh, Red Grant, Fleming... Uh, according to this, was uh, based this on a Jamaican river guide uh, who Fleming's biographer, Andrew Lysett, described as, ready for this? Cheerful, voluble, I have no idea what that is, uh, giant of a villainous aspect. Hmm. Cheerful and villainous aspect. I don't know how those go hand in hand, but I want to meet this guy. <laughs> Anybody in the chat room know sure. what voluble sure. means? Loud. He's loud. He's loud. Boisterous. Yeah. Boisterous. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. This is what I happens think... when you when you drop out of elementary school. Come on. Um, I think I think I think it's uh you know like Fleming's always drawn to these uh, like what was the word used in the uh, the Parker book piratical guys guys that sort of have the spirit of a pirate about them and it probably mm. sounds like this guide was more like that. And he just sort of borrowed the name, but Fleming did borrow names from people he knew and and kind of used them in unflattering ways. That was sort of his his thing, right? Yeah, I think Scaramanga was one, I believe. Yeah, so, Scaramanga yeah. was somebody who bullied his nephew, I believe. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. A terrible fate. Yeah, well, Goldfinger wasn't that. there uh, major complaints from you know the person that was inspired to be <laughs> yeah. Goldfinger? There was some major stuff. So, yeah, but beware it, what you it, say to Fleming; you'll end up in his book. Yeah, I, I think we're safe now, unfortunately. <laughs> no, but you know what? It, it, it's, it is. It's interesting because I know that, for example, um, Karen Bay, you know, we already mentioned, you know, he was, uh, you know, based on an actual person. Um, I would imagine this is what writers do. I mean, I'm not a writer by trade, but, you know, you, you take those conversations and you, you turn them two degrees uh, to the right. But, you know, Kronstein, I know we glossed over very quickly. Um, I do want to talk about something that I noticed people in the chat room have kind of connected on. You know, the, Kronstein to me in the movie is such a great character, the leer, the eyes, the visual. But I also, to Phil's point, really loved Kronstein's more strategic aspects. Like when he has to make an excuse about that three minute delay and how strategic, almost like a chess movie is. Um, Kronstein, I mean, do, do you, if you were to choose, and this might be a fun conversation, movie or novel Kronstein? Which one really kind of sings more? Gosh, well, the, the book, uh, <clears throat> the, the book when you get in his head for a full chapter, which is, you know, just exciting and delightful. Um, but the book when vanishes, Kronstein's still yeah. out there somewhere. Yeah. So there, he's, he's, it's an unsatisfying arc for, for that character because you don't get to see any sort of resolution or comeuppance or whatnot. And, you know, uh, I guess that's true of uh, quite a few, I mean, Rosa Klebb is another one. He just there's an offhand mention, Doctor No. Well, oh, she died, but um, <laughs> the, the the movies did a better job of making it tidy, of sending you home satisfied. Whereas uh, this book has, for a book that a lot of us are calling our favorites, has a lot of loose ends. Hmm. Yeah, I, I completely saw a uh, movie, uh, Kronstein. What was his, uh, the actor's name? Vladek Shibel, I believe. Uh, it was just the, wow. um, uh, the hooded eyes um, and the, uh, the tone of voice. Uh, I, I could not separate the two, to be honest. But, but again, for me, uh, absolutely uh, an example where the, uh, the movie improves over the book, which is, uh, to Phil's point, uh, they bring it back and there's a comeuppance and he's, he's tied off and finished. But for mm. me, uh, uh, movie. I find this like a lot of things uh, with From Russia With Love that the, the book and the film for me don't fight. They build upon each other. They carry, you know, they cover slightly different time frames. And in the, the movie, he's, he stands out as a visual of him, stands in my mind also. But it's good to see the inside as well. So for me, they, they build upon each other quite happily. By the way, as, as much as we're talking about Kronstein, I love how the chat room becomes a brain, a brain trust of its own. And of course, they haven't left the wine discussion. 
So we've got <laughs> something from Calvin Dyson who says, I mean, wine is wine. So I'm not turning it down if it's all that I have on hand. <laughs> I think on the like Orange Express, you have a choice. Um, <laughs> well, let's, let's Express, talk about that. That's all we have. Um. Let's talk about the Orient Express, but let's let's kind of go in order. Um, interesting locations here. I mean, we've got the Soviet mm. Union. We've got Turkey. Uh, we got a very short stop in Athens, a la my Uza. Um, and then, you know, we've got the Orient Express, which although not a direct geography, it kind of is its own location here. Um, mm. Thomas, let's start with you as, as a, you know, adventurer traveler. What did you think about the locations in this movie where they brought to life in the true Fleming tradition? Yeah. I mean, I remember reading this book for the first time and what really struck me is finally I get to read about Turkey in Fleming's voice. Um, and I was surprised reading it, uh, how, how little of the book it is because it really did stay with me from the first time I read it. Um, and it's one of the reasons I love the book is that it has such vivid descriptions of Turkey um, under the second president in Onu. It doesn't reference it directly, but it really does give a very, very strong picture of Turkey at a unique cultural moment. Um, and I can't think of many other writers who've covered it better in English. And I was thinking the other day, there's not many other movies or books where you get a strong Turkish character in the West. Darko Karim is one of the very few strong Turkish men in any British, American or Western stories. Um, so I'm totally happy with that part of the book. There was, uh, Thomas, uh, just to stay on that for a moment, there was a, a bit of discussion outside of the book um, that there were uh, flares, you know, moments, evidence of some racism. Um, and again, you know, it's so difficult to look at 2021 eyes and then look at, you know, 1956 uh, writings. However, um, did you did you come away with any of that? You know, when they were talking about you know uh, people and, and Turkey, etc. No, I, I think Fleming has his own unique voice, and uh, he is quite acrid, uh, and I think becomes more so over the course of the novels. And he's acrid towards pretty well everybody in a pretty even-handed way, I find. Um, so I think if it was if he was writing as politely as he possibly could about Turkey, I'd be worrying what he's hiding. Uh, here he gives very strong, very honest opinions, uh, but they're his own opinions and he did travel there. As I say, I find it extremely vivid. And it adds to the vividness. Yeah. Uh, now, Simon, I'm going to be Just... very careful with you because I am never, ever going to compare you in any way to Ian Fleming because I know it'll make you blush. However, you have traveled and you have spoke passionately about your travels and locations. So how did the locations smack to you in this in this uh, book? Well, I have never been uh, to Istanbul, uh, much less uh, lived there. Uh, and to be honest, uh, I was uh, second time around hoping, or more recent time around of reading the book, hoping to uh, uh, maybe read something more about uh, Paris, which I think is where the, uh, the book uh, finishes up. Uh, but uh, I think it sort of wraps up so quickly that uh, there's absolutely no flavor and no taste, uh, sights or smells of Paris uh, at all. Um, so I probably would have just liked to have read something about that uh, mm -hmm. simply because of uh, some vague knowledge of it. But uh, but no, I mean, I, 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 I certainly haven't been to Istanbul, uh, certainly not back in 1959, I think, which was when the book was written, obviously. Um, but yeah, to me, it reads, uh, it reads very, very well. Many of the locations he talks about in the novel are still unchanged today, right? So he's talking about yeah. the Basilica system, and I mean, that hasn't changed in uh, 1,500 years too much. Um, he talks about the Pera district and that that's been relatively well uh, maintained. So this is uh, where he stays in the hotel. Uh, so a lot of them are iconic locations. Um, and it's well documented that uh, Fleming was sent to Turkey, uh, mm. actually came back again on the Orient Express. So he he experienced those things. We found that with Diamonds Are Forever, you know, in upstate New York, you know, the things that he experiences, he takes those and he he puts seven degrees extra, you know, that extra Fleming on top of it. Uh, really great uh, chat moment from Nicholas Slayton, who says, uh, in terms of context and placing it in the world, Greece was just out of a civil war when Fleming wrote From Russia With Love. And Turkey was amid upheaval. Fantastic choices for locales. So mm. Nicholas has a great point from a timing standpoint. These were things that had resonance. Phil, you know, sure. locations. Talk to me, man. <clears throat> well, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, as you say, pretty self-contained. But <clears throat> I did enjoy reading in, in uh, Fleming's biography that he 
witnessed a lot of that upheaval when he was visiting Turkey and it kind of colored his, his impressions of it. And he was, you know, according to who you read, he was pretty rattled by it, which I think is, you know, pretty interesting. But as far as, uh, you know, the off-sighted Fleming uh, xenophobia or, or, or uh, condescension toward other cultures, I didn't feel it in this book the way you mm. might feel it in some of the other books. Cer certainly it's, it's not one of the, the big uh, aggressors in that department, I don't think. And, and uh, I think it, part of it is because his conduit is Darko Kareem, who he goes really out of his way to say that he's just immediately affectionate toward. Like he goes, I mm -hmm. he loves this man. And he knew immediately he was, he was gonna be a, f a friend of this man. And I think that <clears throat> with, with him as his guide, it becomes a lot more uh, open and tolerant and not, not uh, judgmental the way you might feel some of Fleming's words in, in some other locations. I didn't get any uh, to, uh, racism or xenophobia from uh, from Russia with the Love either. I don't know, David, I'm not looking at your um, chat stream at all. Is there anything coming from that that might suggest something I've missed something? No, no, quite the opposite. And if, if anything, the chat stream, we've, we've, really, we've really made them very sad. And the reason we've made them sad is because, you know, people like uh, Joe Darlington says, man, I miss, miss traveling. Um, You've got Mark Edlitz, wonderful author in his own right, saying, you know, if I could do one thing this year is travel. So th all this talk of locations, and this is what Fleming does. You know, yeah. imagine back in 1956, where people traveled much less than now. Well, mm. maybe not much less than now, but much less <laughs> than a year ago. Um, they, they couldn't go on these adventures. So mm. this was so yeah. incredible. You know, it's like, you know, it, it's like showing things on TV for the first time in color. And well, now we're craving it. And Calvin Dyson says uh, he's been to Istanbul. And he says, when he was there, we visited the cisterns underneath the city where mm -hmm. Karim uh, takes Bond in the film. And it's absolutely beautiful. So if anything, people are just waxing poetic about locations. Sure. But, you know, the Orient Express part is I get really wistful because uh, I don't think that we anybody of a certain age on this in this conversation was ever going to experience that sort of bygone elegance of, of railway travel. I mean, he even talked about how it's kind of like, uh, it's, uh, it's degrading, you know, the experience is not what it was five years before he got there, you know, Fleming did, but I've hopped around Europe on a, on a Eurostar and it's certainly not, not the same experience at all. <laughs> well, isn't, uh, isn't it, isn't that true, Phil? I mean, and, and think of us, I mean, we, we consume so much, uh, you know, of, of the written word and obviously movies, but there are some cities and locations that just lend to spy and intrigue. And I, I think, you know, um, I could say, you know, quite frankly, you know, uh, Asia does that very well, um, you know, Istanbul, you know, but a lot of these places really lend to that gravitas. Mm. This By the way, time was a very, very interesting place. I mean, you've got, it's the first, it was one of the first members of NATO. And here you've got, you know, nuclear missiles within Turkey at the time. Um, of course, that gives you the Kennedy connection. Um, so it was just going through its democratization process or rather had in the decades before um, the second president locking it down to make sure it stayed that way. Uh, so it was a rather interesting place. Absolutely. By the way, I've got to pass on some messages that we're having. Um, AJ Chowdhury, Ace Toots, uh, says, congratulations, David. I'm really enjoying the eloquent observations of Monsieur Crichton, Nobile, oh. and Firth. Simon, I enjoyed your wonderful book, and I'll pass on regards to Ross Hendry. Who is Ross Hendry? Ross Hendry, uh, gosh, he was the guy who actually started the James Bond British fan club back in mm. 1979, I believe, and uh, before passing on the torch to Graham Rye. Oh, my gosh. Well, there you go. I, you just hacked my life. I know something more. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I want to I want to carve out for a moment because people have been talking about it. Not everybody has experienced, you know, there's there's more than one Orient Express, but mm. from an Orient Express standpoint, you know, I think there was a lot of focus and discussion of the Orient Express, the description of it. Um, you know, let's start with Phil on this one. The Orient Express being used as kind of its own character in the story. How, how effective do you think that was? Uh, quite, quite effective. And, and I think it, <clears throat> it's, uh, he paints a picture of it again that, that made me wish that this was a thing we could go experience. Mm. And I do not believe it's, it's anything close to uh, something we can do at this point, right? There's no- 
I believe that there is uh, an Orient Express, uh, uh, and I believe um, there's a, a murder mystery sort of thing you can do. Uh, but I think oh, yeah. you, uh, yeah, no, you've got to do some theatricals. Uh, so it's not exactly the same as being on the Orient Express in from Russia yeah. Love at all. But no, I think it still exists in some form or other like that. Yeah, but it, it becomes self-aware, right? So it's mm. it's been probably Disneyfied to some degree uh, in terms of uh, turned into this experience that. Uh, where you're just chasing, you're, you're chasing the dragon, you're chasing this thing that you're never going to get. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I enjoyed spending time in Fleming's version of the Orient Express. So I've got to, I've got to tell you, for those of you who want to experience the Orient Express, there is a replica. And I think they may actually have original pieces of the Orient Express in Napa Valley in California. If you're ever there for wine country and I took an Orient Express wine tour now, please, be forgiving in the comment section. I understand this is a little bit of cosplay, that it's not the actual Orient Express or the roots or anything like that. But when you go on there, you have the tablecloth, you know, the dining and, and you know, the fineries of the Orient Express. So I can absolutely imagine that this was just kind of a miracle of luxury back in 1956. Do you have any I'm idea wondering... whether people would actually have to uh, dress up uh, in, and as fine as the Orient Express is, um, is there any uh, expectation or requirement even to, um, uh, to go appropriately attired? Unfortunately not. I almost wish there was a dress code because I think it would, it would create the atmosphere. I mean, you, you, yeah. you, take a, you take a train and you take food and you take libation and the one thing missing are the characters. And as soon as you dress somebody up, the characters become the players in the play. And that, that's not what happens. People come in on shorts. You yeah. know, I, I was there with shorts. a client. You know, it's always good to do this on an expense account. I sound like James <laughs> Bond. Um, but I mean, that's, that's an important thing to do. So for me, I'm wondering uh, as it's in wine country, if you had fish and if you had fish, what wine did you have for the fish? <laughs> I went the uh, the route of uh, Calvin Dyson, the only wine that was on hand. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> By the way, we've got a question uh, for the group. Uh, Ian Fleming's From Russia With Love is so rich with hinterland and backstory. If we ever got a 007 expanded universe, which elements would you further explore? So what, what tendrils, what octopus limbs would fly out from this <laughs> novel? And which ones would you flesh out either in movie form or novel form? Because, I you know, a lot of these bad know. guys, even you don't know what happens to them. Mm. By the way, that was some AJ know. Chowdhury. Nice one. Nice question. I would absolutely go for Karen Bay growing up and all his Ooh. brothers and his mother and his father. Yes. And I absolutely love to see that. Uh, they yes. are portrayed as Laz Turks. It's never really said, uh, but it is a uh, Turkey has about 28 ethnic groups. And the portrayal of them as Black Sea, uh, Blue Eye Turks is, is very much that. Um, so we refer to the comments about whether it's prejudicial. Um, there's a lot of Turkish jokes about Last Turks anyway. <laughs> um, so I feel he might be picking up on some of the local uh, descriptions of them. But I'd love to see that, that wild piratical upbringing. I like that. What about you, the rest of you guys? Oh, specifically, yeah, I was going to say the same, uh, but uh, oh my word, there's no way you could, uh, I guess, uh, dress him up as being a hero right from the beginning, because um, I, I believe I'm right in remembering that, uh, didn't he uh, get his wife and tie her up and, sh and shove her under the table uh, for a spell? Yeah. Yes, yep. just with chains. You just all. got to address that issue, I think. Uh, so quite how that gets explored, I have no, I have no idea, but he's by far and away the mo uh, most interesting, for me at least. I think uh, you can do a weekly series where Kronstein is this anti-hero, like on the level of like James Spader in the blacklist where he's, he's, a, he's a fixer of some kind and you, you hate him, but you love to hate him. And he, and he gets <laughs> thrown into like, you know, these sort of intriguing situations and, and you, it's just about his, his brain solving, uh, you know, global espionage issues. Oh, I like that. that. You know what? You guys, you guys kind of hit it out of the park on that. I really do like that. Uh, by the way, naturally, and, and we're, we're going to jump into this area, uh, you know, very passionate about this next discussion. We got to talk about lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I mean, Fleming lived a certain lifestyle. Um, he, he, he really infused his mm -hmm. hero and even the villains with that lifestyle. And then the movies were a part of that lifestyle, uh, even to the point I think some people mentioned here, um, I just want to make sure I'm quoting the right people. Ah, zero minus 11 says, um, 
did they talk about Bond's breakfast at his flat? I only just joined. So you could tell that he was whispering on the chat. <laughs> yeah, right we haven't. Time. You're right on time. <laughs> this is where we talk about it because I love the parts, the lifestyle aspects of when they're really pushing apart um, who Bond is, but also the other people. I mean, Phil, as a, uh, as a lifestyle bonder yourself, mm. uh, what did you think about the for treatment the, here? For the guy who just joined. Um, yeah. Well, well, you know, the, the lifestyle stuff, there's, there's good and bad. You know, like I think Rosa Klebs' nicotine stained mustache technically is a lifestyle po point, but we don't like that. Um, <laughs> I think. I think uh, Speak for yourself. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I love, again, I'm repeating myself, but the, the idea of seeing the moments of Bond's life that you're never going to get around to in the movies and that breakfast stuff is such a good part of it. His, his uh, rather unstrenuous workout. It's not quite your 4 a.m. P90X, is it, David? What, what, what is his workout, Phil? Oh, gosh, I think it's uh, 20 push-ups. Yes. And then he touches his toes and then he does a knees bend with deep breathing until he's exhausted. What else do you need? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't think that's going to get you that Bond physique. Oh. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, and you know better. Uh, but, but, but here's the thing. So, Phil, this is so funny because, I mean, I can't help but think that maybe, maybe that's what Fleming thinks is a workout. Yeah. Well, you've seen the man. I haven't. And, and you know, he kind of died sort of young. So, yeah, so David, lesson to be on learned. The, on that lifestyle tip and dying young, are you worried about the iron crab? <laughs> that Darko Karem says is going to come get him one day. Don't you know what? I'm constantly worried about that. And the, and the lower GI crabs too, as well. Both. Oof. You went there. Too much information. <laughs> Goodbye. Thomas, you, Bye. Fleming never dies. As much as you say that the Fleming, you know, your whole channel is about the fact that Fleming just courses mm -hmm. through your veins, your very blood. But damn it, man, you, you post pictures of clothing and travels. So from a lifestyle standpoint, where do you stand on this? Yeah, I love the insight into it. And uh, on my Instagram, I think I've shown pictures of the, the mutton ragu that comes up in the gypsy camp. And I very much enjoy the, uh, the inflaming breakfast. I have to say, I'm not sure if the, the workout would work off the calories of the breakfast. Uh, but it's very, very enjoyable. And yeah, I enjoy it. It's, it's, there's so much food and drink. What is it in 14 books? He talks about 70 different recipes. And of course, considering the numbers of times he talks about scrambled eggs, the food comes up in it quite a lot. Um, so yeah, I love going through all the recipes of James Bond. Um, goodness me, I was reading Chitty Chitty Bang Bang for the first time recently. And there Ian Fleming gives actual recipes for how to make this food. Oh my <laughs> gosh. It? Seven in New York, he gives the recipe for scrambled eggs. Finally, um, is, so yeah, is Chitty, Chitty Bang Bang worth a read? Yeah, I, I belted through it and thoroughly enjoyed it. It's it's kind of a, an interesting kind of alternative in Fleming. So it's the same year it came out as uh, You Only Live Twice, and it's completely different. But you do end up with this tall, slim, raw naval officer uh, who likes scrambled eggs. Um, <laughs> yes, there are certain similarities. He can only step so far away from the book. <laughs> and by the way, Simon, I want to hear from you. But you know, it's interesting as we talk about lifestyle. I will, I will act as the confessional here, and I want to hear from all of you about this. There have been many things. Obviously, the movie has influenced me to try and even adopt as a part of my life. Um, the, the books have as well. You know, I, I've tried the cold shower. It's horrendous. Um, I've tried some of the things. I've tried probably every recipe, possibly every drink. I mean, maybe even on this uh, Zoom uh, right now. But Simon, you know, as you looked at the lifestyle moments, um, how did this book kind of connect with you? Was it, was it high on the lifestyle ranking? Uh, actually, uh, actually, no. Um, and I'm probably sort of sucking hind tit on the whole uh, lifestyle thing. To be honest, this has mm. uh, been massively and greatly introduced uh, uh, to me uh, through your channel, David. Uh, but uh, I have said that uh, to, to many people, and probably the people that know me best, my family, uh, would say that actually uh, many interests have uh, developed through the portal of James Bond. Uh, and so through that introduction, you can find something interesting. If it was presented to you by your, uh, your headmaster, then it might have been an entirely different proposition. But for me, uh, no, listening to the uh, the various answers that were coming up, I was actually struggling to see what the lifestyle would have been from this book, other than uh, the uh, the breakfast and also the uh, Sea Island cotton uh, shirts, mm. which to this day, I must admit, I 
I do not know what uh, what that is, but it sounds fantastic, and I know I want it. I don't know why to this day that I haven't um, actually found it, found out what this is, and, and bought something. But but for me, it's generally speaking, it's the food, uh, and I will I will share this with you. Uh, again, when I was reading the books uh, back when I was sort of fifteen or sixteen, it was a it was a birthday, uh, and I had just finished reading uh, Goldfinger. Then there was uh, this recipe where I think he and uh, Dupont uh, sat down to soft shell crabs and uh, hot yeah. butter sauce and pink champagne. I think I'm getting that right. Joe's and crab, I yeah. Begged my mother to make it, and um, and she was actually uh, she was actually a, a high school cookery teacher, yeah. and she did her level best. Uh, but I mean, so. so so beautiful did that food read uh, as it came off the, off the page. Uh, I mean, I was salivating just reading it. Um, and, and bless my mother, she uh, she did a, a bloody good job with it. Um, so these are the things that I tend to experience more uh, through the Fleming books. So Simon, for somebody that's not into the lifestyle, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, I'm actually wearing Sea Island cotton right now. This is a Sunspell long sleeve shirt. That's Sea Island cotton. It's It's some of the rarest cotton it is so soft. It's like material. It's like very lightweight, a very soft. It's very fine, very tight woven. Um, and, and I'll make some recommendations on, uh, on kind of ones that will, uh, will change your life. But more importantly, to me, the lifestyle moments that Fleming introduces is exactly what you described. It's not so much getting every recipe right or every location right. It's a little bit about the pomp and circumstance. And I remember years ago, reading one of the books and Bond was talking about ham sandwiches with extra mustard. And for some reason, I couldn't get ham sandwiches with extra mustard out of my mind. And Michael Poplowski, who's on this, uh, The Culture of Bond, he's on the chat room right now. He, he eats and drinks like Fleming every mm. single day, every single meal, which I don't know how you do and not die, but I've got oh. a Deadpool on him. But what my <laughs> point is that is that when I had that ham sandwich with extra mustard, it transported me to the moment. So it's more about what happens between your ears with the lifestyle than getting the actual right recipe, the right thing, the right brand. That's just trappings. What do you guys think? It sounds about right. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun to sort of, uh, to have a little project for yourself. I'm going to create this thing that was in here. I'm going to see if I can, you know, make this version, that kind of thing. But on the Sea Island cotton tip, you know, some some of the stuff I've I've moved past, like how, how something would look to the to the thing you're talking about. How does it feel? And what, you know what I have in Sea Island Cotton underwear. Nobody's oh. seen that. Nobody's seen that except Amanda upstairs. Yeah, but put uh, it around your wedding tackle. Why not? It's and it's delightful. But I I did not know what Sea Island Cotton was before I read the Fleming books. And so that that's a a demonstrable thing that I've taken from the books. And and the you know the Chemex thing. The and it's not just about doing the thing that happened in the book, but you know, you try it, are you getting anything out mm -hmm. of it? Yes or no. And I, as I said earlier, you know, like, I like that morning ritual now. And I, and I like that I'm not, you know, sending my, you know, pre-ground coffee through a piece of plastic. It's, it makes a difference. Um, so that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I've been sober for a few years now, so I'm not, I'm not on the bond booze tip anymore, yeah, but totally um, I did my time and uh, that part was great too. Um, but yeah, I, I think I agree with what you're saying. It's 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 about uh, you know not just I I own this thing that was in this book, but like where, where does it take you yeah. mentally? And does it take you on someplace good? And and is that is it healthy? And you're not hurting anybody? Then then you're great. Mm. You know what it is also to me, it's about the slowdown. I mean, you think about our lives. You know, for some reason, for some bizarre, morbid reason, we wear as a badge how long and how hard we work in our jobs. You know, oh, boss, I worked 14 hours today. I got up at 4 a.m. in the morning and started working. And to me, what Fleming really preaches is slowing things down. And so your Chemex is not the fastest way to do it. I've got an espresso 10 feet from me that goes much faster than that. But the pomp and circumstance of shaving with a straight edge or making your Chemex coffee is a lost art and it forces us to slow down and enjoy the moment. And it's not happening anymore. And, and it's, it's, it's often very sad. And when I read these books from 1956, I realize it's a lost art. It's a yeah. lost art. And I, by the way, I call it, um, it self-care because 
self-care <clears throat> moments are about taking time for you because if you don't do it, nobody's going to. By the way, Daniel House wanted to know, did I use English mustard or French? But I used German mustard because I'm married to a German woman. That's uh -oh. what we had. Oof, sorry. Mm. You know, the slowdown is really interesting because the slowdown has been sort of imposed on a lot of us this year, hasn't it? Like we, we were living our lives a certain way and now like involuntarily that, that our schedules have been upended and that I've used the time this year to kind of like indulge in that stuff a little bit more, indulge in, in things that are more contemplative and, and maybe taking a half hour to have a cup of coffee uh, because I can now. And I yeah. think, you know, if, if there's something to be mined from any of that lifestyle stuff is that we do, whether we like it or not at the moment, have the time to sort of explore these little ritualistic things that have a sort of a romantic attachment to Fleming or the past or what have you. I, I agree. Now, Thomas, as someone that lives on the mainland of China, um, mm. and, and by the way, I hear Elliot Carver is, is alive. He did not die in Tomorrow Never Dies and is oh, living yeah. in the mainland of China. Very happy, very still putting out tomorrow papers. I'm so sorry to hear it. We, we all are, but you know, give the people what they want. Um, so tell me, I mean, is it a different way of life from a, from a slow down lifestyle standpoint in, in the culture you are surrounded by? I live in one of the Chinese mega cities. So there's about 14 million people here and what? the pace of life is very, very fast. Um, so this area has got about 130 million people in it altogether. If you take Hong Kong, the city I'm in, <clears throat> Guangzhou, Macau altogether, it's a very, very small area. But 130 is thought to be, 140 million is thought to be the population. And it is very, very, very fast paced. Um, so talking of trains, I've just been on a high speed train going to another province where I was amazed at how slow the life was. Um, mm. It's a part of the place I visited where you can actually try the traditional Chinese tea. Whereas here, there's no time for any of that. I love what the uh, Fleming Reading Challenge has done for us because to read a book or in Phil's case, even just to listen to a book, you can't rush it. You can't fast forward it. You're going to skip some of the best moments. So it does force you to actually maturely listen to these things. Uh, there's a great quote. I love this from Alex Lamas, who is just, he's a loyalist. He's been on every single one of this. Alex, thanks thanks for joining us every single time. He, he says it very simply and, and in a very short, concise way. He says, it's about savoring every bit, every sip. And isn't that so true? I mean, Simon, you said to me earlier, I asked you in a very pithy, sardonic way, you know, do you have more of those uh, trigger drinks? And you said, no, I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy this one. So Simon, as someone from Windsor, I mean, do, do, do these Fleming moments, do they help you slow down and enjoy lifestyle? Uh, well, so my situation is that I'm very slow at the moment because uh, lockdown has, uh, has made my sort of form of self-employment um, uh, redundant. Uh, so I oh. have uh, been enjoying uh, the slow life, um, although an enforced slow life for the last uh, 10 or so months. But the uh, the cocktails, uh, certainly, I uh, I do enjoy um, making the cocktails. So I've got a couple of the, uh, the Bond books. Uh, I do, uh, I did uh, make a point. Uh, or when I was getting interested in some of the cocktails uh, to when I went to a smart bar to sit at the bar and to talk to the, the mixologist and to find out what I was doing wrong or what they were doing or what it was uh, what they were doing differently. I enjoy the process. I enjoy mixing the, uh, the, the ingredients. I enjoy talking to uh, my neighbors who have uh, their own ways of making cocktails. I, uh, I do not like to stand outside uh, in, uh, in the rain. I would like to enjoy the whole process from the very beginning to the very last drop. Uh, but yes, uh, even if I wasn't, um, even if I wasn't uh, 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 slowed down in an enforced way, I would uh, still take the time over the cocktail. It's a very important part of the day. Mm. I love that. And by the way, we've got uh, a gentleman on here, uh, Michael, who is describing to all of us just the simplest way to make scrambled eggs. You know, scrambled eggs seem like scrambled eggs. I mean, is there anything sophisticated? But he says scrambled eggs are easy. Take them off before they get hard. Oh, uh, steak is so easy. Hot pan, four minutes on one side, flip it another four, then get it the hell off before it overcooks. Trust. <laughs> I love this. By the way, if you ever want to find truth in life, don't go to a self-help book. Go to, go to the chat room. One of these Bond book clubs. All right. We, we're going to play um, something that I like to call a comparison. And now I need all my panelists 
you know, drink your coffee, drink your Turkish slash not Turkish tea, have a sip of your trigger. There you go. Um, because you're going to need it. And I want and need the live chat to play along. I'm going to be looking in the live chat. I'm going to be calling out live chat moments during this time because we're human beings. And chances are most of us, if not all of us, saw a Bond movie before we read a Bond book. So I want us to think and put on our caps and think about from a book standpoint, what did the book do better than the movie? And what did the movie do better than the book? And we've already talked about some of those, but I'm going to go to my panelists first as the chat room starts to think and post. But who wants to jump in here? What did the book do better? What did the movie do better? I'll jump in with the movie. Uh, for me, uh, the uh, promotion of the uh, movie uh, was better because it kept Red Grant as a uh, viable and visible threat throughout the, uh, the, the entire two hours. I like mm -hmm. that. I like that. Yeah, it was, a, it was a constant, wasn't it? It really, really was. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting point because we, you know, I think there's a, there's a sort of a snobbish attitude toward old movies where you go, oh, well, this, this was a quaint adaptation, but really you have to read this book to really understand what a thoughtful adaptation that the film was. Like they really sorted out some kinks uh, that, that would not have worked as a film. And, and they really, you know, I hate to say it. I, th I think the movie is a better story than the film because it, it's all those loose ends we talked about get tied up. And the idea that just, I just love the, I love the incarnation of Spectre from, from Russia with love, mm -hmm. just that meeting in Blofeld's yacht with that fucking Adams family lineup of, of, of agents. It's just so colorful. And the, and the book is colorful as well, but the, uh, he takes such great, pains to try to tell you this is how Smirsh really is. Like even with like an intro in the, before the book starts, you know, this is real, this was, this was the real address. But the movie, um, the movie takes you on a, a different kind of ride. Yeah. The movie has way better music than the book too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I disagree. By the way, Nicholas Slayton says, I love the humor of the book. Very dark, very clever. Yeah, I wouldn't call the, the movie very humorous. It's one of the best, spy intrigue movies out there. Calvin Dyson says the book does a better job, job with the introduction of Red Grant. I guess he doesn't like uh, the, the uh, very slimy, very uh, shiny Red Grant being massaged uh, at, at Pinewood Studios, but he likes, and yes, you're right, Calvin, that is a better introduction. Um, Michael Poplowski says the books um, is better at telling uh, and explaining what Bond is thinking during the mission and the sure. details that are missed in the movies. And a bunch of people are saying that Bond, the books show Bond's vulnerability. And that's true. I mean, if you watch From Russia With Love, Bond is a superhero of a secret agent. So I would agree with that. But um, wh wh what else, panelists? What, what else do you think the book does better? What do you think the movie does better? That whole inner life thing. You're, you're never going to know what a character is thinking in a movie the way that a book can paint that picture for you. That's That stuff is great. I think the... Uh... <sighs> The, uh, as as uh, Simon pointed out earlier, Red Red Grant vomiting the whole plot to Bond as as he as they're waiting for the tunnel to come so he can kill him, and then yeah. he shoots him in his cigarette case. I think that the train fight is obviously one of the top moments of all the the film franchise. So I think that the the film beats that handily there. Well, um, the, the, I'll tell you, Phil. The the chat room is uh, firmly on your side. Not perfected yet. Says movie did more justice to Bond. It's more of a Bond thing. And in the book, he doesn't kill Kurlanku. Kiram does. He doesn't steal the Spectre. Tanya does. He spends a lot of the book following Kiram and being told what's going on, as opposed to experiencing it. And I I think that's a really good point. Tim Hands, for example, says the book is better. It's got a shock ending. The film uh, moves at a better brisk pace, but that shock ending. And we do need to talk about the book's ending because if you think mm. about the ending of the movie versus the book, I mean, this was this whole thing. I mean, it's well-documented. Fleming admitted he kind of wanted to kill off Bond. I'm going to read something to everybody. And you probably read it if you read this book. Breathing became difficult. Bond sighed to the depth of his lungs. He clenched his jaws and 
half closed his eyes, as people do when they want to hide their drunkenness. He prized his eyes open. Now he had to gasp for breath. Again, his hand moved up towards his cold face. He had an impression of Mathis staring towards him. Bond felt his knees begin to buckle. He pivoted slowly on his heel and crashed headlong to the wine red floor. And I don't know why I channeled um, uh, William Shatner at the end there. I apologize. <laughs> um, but that's a shocking ending mm. to the book. I mean, uh, Simon, what, when you read this again, were you floored by that ending? Uh, right. Gosh. Uh, so when I was when I read it again, no, because I was uh, aware of what was going on. I think that when I probably read it the first time, uh, wet behind the ears and fifteen years old or whatever, uh, then and I was I was reading these things out of sequence, and I probably was not paying attention to the uh, bibliography and the uh, the first printings and this that and the other. Uh, so, I gosh, when I first read it, I probably thought this might have been the last James Bond book, but then of course uh, John Gardner came out with something. Um, I do think it was a, uh, the whole book was brave. Who has a successful character and leads them out for the first uh, third of the book and mm -hmm. then kills them off at the end? It was, uh, I don't know whether it was brave. Uh, I don't know whether it was induced by um, uh, courage or whether he was just that fed up with uh, the character. Um, but I couldn't wait to go and start reading Dr. No. Mm. And when he's getting he's getting rid of the poison. Yeah. And by the way, in the chat room, it's it's fascinating to read. And by the way, for those that the chat room is going to uh, too quick, if you do rewatch this, read the chat room, first and foremost, don't look at our faces, you know what our faces look like. But um, Turbillion, for example, says, as a Swede, I loved that the Russian generals said that the Swedish intelligence was the most dangerous to them in the 50s. So these are really moments in time. The book does that incredibly well, but there's some brave moments because Fleming did a lot of brave things. He put in real life facts. I mean, the specter is the enigma, right? I mean, there, there's yeah. real people in here. There's real societies. I mean, it was a bit of a middle finger. And he said, look, I, I could get in big trouble. Can you imagine writing something like this today and calling out underground societies and and uh you know warring factions and things like that you you turn it to uh you know rushdie so this was a very brave thing and then on top of that you've got a great point to end it where your hero your money maker shake that money maker uh is now possibly dead and what was it like a year year and a half until the next movie dr no came out that's pretty ballsy mm. yeah what did you guys think <clears throat> about that I liked it. And... Please go ahead, Tom. Oh, oh, okay, thank you. So I read it for the first time in order. And so I mm. saw him going up against Smush and again, kind of becoming the, the famous secret agent. There's always the criticism, say, of the 70s movies that he's a secret agent, but everyone knows his name. But of course, he's had so many successes against the Russians. And suddenly it makes sense that they know who he is. They want to go for him. And it does kind of become, yeah, it does become a serious question. So I do like the idea he might have been killed off. I mean, I suppose Arthur Conan Doyle trying to kill off Sherlock Holmes is the closest thing to it. So this is his Reichenbach Falls. And then after that, you do see a very different bond, I feel, as he starts to go up against criminal organizations. And it's a very different character as well as he gets older and more jaded. And uh, I say some of, in some ways, the character goes downhill in a way mm. that I don't think we've seen too much in the films. So I feel as I read the books for the first time, the first one didn't feel like James Bond to me because I was used to the films. It felt like a different entity on its own right, yeah. which I liked. It gradually built up and up and up towards kind of Sean Connery's Bond, especially when Thunderball came out. Yeah. And then suddenly it turns into a different character and declines over the course of the series. That's a great point. And, and David West, who has a lot of foundation, has a lot of roots, uh, obviously worked for Bond in motion, um, been kind of saturated, marinated in the Bond franchise has a really good point and a question. Should the movie have had the same ending as the book or would that have been too risky for the second it, film? It would have been too abrupt, I'll tell you that. Mm. Um, <laughs> the one thing that jumped out at me when I read it, and I just want to use this as a visual, is that they get off the train on page 250 and the book ends on page 259. This is how much is left <laughs> after. This is the train and this is the little Paris hotel room where they're, it's just, and then they've got to like shoehorn Mathis or Matisse in there at the end because he, the Allies dead. It's 
it just, it felt so weirdly abrupt mm. uh, in terms of pacing. Yeah. And this is another thing that the film did where they, they stuck a boat chase in a helicopter uh, sequence in between. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. but yeah, it's too early, right? Like as a second film, I don't think the audience is as invested yet. Yeah. Like if a fourth film had a cliffhanger like that, it might have played. And you've got to respect the, the specter bonds because, I mean, uh, Eddie Sedwick, who has some great comments on YouTube in general, you know, says basically that's the great thing about the specter bonds. There's a real source of concerted planned evil, not just mm -hmm. some nut with money and a huge ego. And by the way, Phil, I think, I think they're referring to you when they say that, but I, I, I don't want to cast aspersions. I don't have that much money. Eh, it's a pretty Either, nice yeah. arch behind you, my friend. <laughs> Those arches don't come extra. I mean, they, actually, they are extra. It was like that when I got here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Jerry Mana says, as a writer and reader, this is great. I love cliffhangers at the end of chapters. I'm less a fan at the end of books, however, though I like some open-ended elements that whet the appetite for more and leave open questions. That is an interesting question. Simon, let's, 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 let's grapple with Jerry. Because Jerry's saying like, yeah, put it at a chapter, but I want resolution. The fact that you didn't have resolution here, but of course, you know, Bond survives. How did that leave you? Well, I think as I said before, I, uh, I was reading the books um, uh, out of order. Um, I, uh, uh, I knew that there were other books. Um, it was it, the whole book when I first read it uh, was, not a, was not a happy experience. Uh, but as I say, I was I was very very young when I first read it. Um, right now, uh, I'm going back to, uh, to to what Phil said uh, about the the abruptness. But I mean, the way in which the uh, the way in which the abruptness was actually led up to it with just mm -hmm. uh, a couple of pages of Paris. Uh, where normally uh, uh, with Ian Fleming's writing, you always have uh, such a good sense of place, uh, the sense of the smells, the colors and everything else. Uh, we were just completely bereft of all of that. And so Paris, dead, gone. Um, mm. Yeah, it was, it was a hole uh, to be sure. But then yeah. of course you've got the next book to go to. And... I like that sense that you have this gaping hole at the end because you are used to being so saturated by him. And then suddenly, yeah, it does feel as shocking as shocking as a death. Okay, Thomas, let me test that. Oh. So let's, let's take this idea uh -huh. of what Fleming did in this book and apply mm -hmm. it to today. So we just had a delay of no time to die. Mm. Would you be okay? And Thomas, we're going to start with you. We're going to get a round of the panelists, but I want everybody in the live chat to play along. Yeah. Would you be okay with no time to die ending on a cliffhanger? Thomas. Um, I was just thinking earlier, you know, you have your second film. Can you have a cliffhanger for a second film with lots of loose threads? I was thinking The Empire Strikes Back was a second film with a cliffhanger and a lot of loose mm. ends. Um, for Daniel Craig, of course, it would be, you know, at the end of his tenure. So really the end of his tenure with so many loose ends. I'm, I'm okay with that. I really am. Um, I, I think that sometimes some of my favorite novels do have that kind of open ending because uh, life isn't tidy. So if they had Bond... It's kind of nebulous, you know, is he, isn't he alive? What's going on in his life? You'd be okay with that. I think it would suit Daniel Craig very, very well, right? Mm -hmm. I can't, I'm not sure if it would suit Pierce Brosnan. I'm not sure if it would really suit Roger Moore. I think there's a couple of films that suggest there might be a cliffhanger and then quickly resolves it. Um, but for Daniel Craig, I think it genuinely might suit him. I'd be By okay. the way, we uh, just, before we get to Phil and Simon on this uh, uh, question, chat room is, is hot. Hot, hot. So we've got yes, no, no. Oh, brilliant question. Thank you. Uh, yes, no, absolutely not. No, if it's DC's last, absolutely not. Yes, yes, no. That's just some of them. We'll read the rest. Uh, but Phil, what do you feel? Good Lord. I, I maybe would be, I maybe would have been up for it uh, in 2012. Uh, I, I, I think that when the first delay happened. Yes, no. you know, back in our youth. The, the, uh, the idea of a cliffhanger uh, for a film that we've been waiting two plus years to come out, that's a, that's a little taxing for me. So right. it, it, it maybe, maybe in a, a normal timeline, a cliffhanger would work, but the movies are different, aren't they? Because we know this is Craig's last one. So what sort of, what kind of cliffhanger is, is it gonna come, 
come back to? Is he a time Lord? Does he come back as another person? <laughs> How does that, how's that going to play? Um, no, I'm more excited with the idea and I don't, I've, I've avoided all spoilers, but just the, the sense that I get is that they're writing a final James Bond story, right? Mm. So he, he's retired and whatnot. And I've always been intrigued by <clears throat> trying to, uh, uh, create a mythology right so back in the old comics days in the 80s it became a popular thing to write the final batman story or, or the final uh and alan moore wrote a whole thing about how all proper myths have to have an ending and so i'm more invested in that idea that that they're going to craft an ending for the myth and then th that'll give them a clean slate to reboot but uh gosh i mean what's the closest we've had to a cliffhanger it was it was it him shooting mr white in the knee at the end of casino royale uh, the, um, death that's of, the death of his wife, maybe, in OGMSS. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good that, one, too. That, that they abandoned immediately after, sadly. <laughs> well, they uh, kind of brought it back in For Your Eyes Only, but it was a, it was a, a small little nod, but yes, that was it. Yes, right. Yeah. But but uh, you know I will tell you the live chat is uh, is is firmly I would say at least seventy five to eighty percent behind no cliffhanger. I think a lot of that is because of the Charlie Brown Lucy football moments of you know do we want to wait five to six years <laughs> to try yeah. to figure out what happened in the cliffhanger, uh, especially yeah. if it's it's a really sharp one as opposed to a few people are saying you know if it's nebulous. In other words, if if Bond's situation is is up to interpretation let's call it that artistic interpretation yeah. of what happens to him as opposed to this big finale that says i'm wrapping it in a bow and it's got a beautiful package they're open to that but a cliffhanger i would say people are kind of against it hmm. although well, shane mackey says that fun. irma bunt is still out there remember that <laughs> yeah That's a good point never forget Never I'm going to go. I'm going to go. No, uh, no cliffhanger. And uh, to be honest, uh, I think that um, a cliffhanger actually might just be uh, a cheap shot. Um, you know, uh, we we look at uh, the uh, Naomi Harris uh, issue. Is she not going to be money penny? Of course, we already always going to know that. Uh, Christoph Waltz is he always not going to be um, uh, Blofeld? The cliffhangers, uh, uh, all the uh, the information that we are not supposed to be privy to at the time, uh, has never really fallen well. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would much prefer to see a uh, a well crafted, emotional, uh, but a mm -hmm. well crafted um, uh, denouement. Um, yeah, absolutely. No, no cliffhanger. Understood, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Thomas, Phil, Simon. The reality is, is that um, when we talk about the Bond community, it, it almost seems like a cliche term, and that's only because I think a lot of us use it in a very affectionate way, and. You know, it is the conversations of the Bond community that have kept us going, will continue to keep us going for the next nine months and have kept us going over the last hour and 42 minutes. Um, what I'd love to do at this point is I'd love to go around quick summation. You know, we I asked a very simple question up front. I asked, you know, what was your kind of overall with from Russia with love? I'd love to you to give any kind of final thoughts. They can be as short or as long as you want. But Phil, why don't we start with you? You know, this experience of going back to the book from Russia with Love, this, this conversation today, um, any last thoughts? Uh, well, I was grateful for the opportunity to revisit the book. Um, I'd been watching the previous installments of this, so this was fun and I was really glad to hear you invite me uh, and enjoy revisiting the book for that reason. <clears throat> but it reinforced what uh, I've not enjoyed about the films lately is that the, uh, to me, the best bonds are, as someone had already said, the, the ones where you are a little ahead of him, where, where you know what's happening before Bond does. It's very Hitchcockian, it's very classic uh, storytelling, but for whatever reason, and especially Inspector, Mendez just got it in his head that, that we were going to be as in the dark as Bond was. For, for, and I'd love to get away from that model. I'd love to get back to this classic Fleming model of, of uh, how, how we go through that adventure with Bond, because I think that From Russia With Love is, is pretty much the, the gold standard. I agree. Thomas, last thoughts. For me, reading it recently, I enjoyed the intrigue. I enjoyed the eccentricity that it refers to several times as an eccentric plan. And this is what kind of appeals to them. I enjoyed all the sensations that I enjoyed the first time. It was talking about smells. It was talking about taste. Um, and, but most of all, I was really looking at really the plot 
uh, and seeing it kind of fully laid out uh, from beginning to end from how roses just suddenly come up in the final chapter kind of mirroring the beginning I enjoyed how it all came together Fleming's a very very efficient writer there's a very short book I believe there's paper rationing at the time uh, it's a very very <laughs> short condensed book and but in so few words he conveys such strong emotion and such strong senses so oh, it's a pleasure to revisit it well that's great simon your last yeah honestly so thank moments. you very much indeed for um uh enforcing a uh, a, a much delayed reread um and uh, and and having reread it again in a uh, more matured fashion than i initially did um i have to say if uh, if this was an experimental novel uh, i'm now of the opinion that uh, I would have liked to have stayed in the minds of uh, Tatiana. I would like to stay in the minds mm. of uh, uh, Grant uh, and have Bond almost be uh, the person who's, uh, who's thinking we don't see uh, since yeah. the setup uh, was so masterful uh, for the first, uh, what did you say, 11 chapters? Uh, I would like to have seen uh, what was going through the minds of Tatiana and whether in fact um, uh, she was falling in love uh, or just going on with the mission because I, have, I was left confused with that. Mm. Uh, so stopping all of that insight into the protagonist thinking and then just uh, making about bond and breakfast uh, actually it jarred uh, and so yeah. i would i would like to have had actually bond uh, remain for the rest of that novel as um as, as a third party whose thoughts we're not privy to i think that's a great point i you know it's interesting too because you know it is a bit of a rorschach test every time we connect with different people every time we revisit this we we walk away with something um, I do want to thank all of my guests. I want to thank Thomas, Phil, and Simon for the time. These things don't happen by themselves. I want to thank everybody that's been in the live chat that have, have visited this discussion or, or may visit this discussion afterwards. I think it's a worthy discussion. You know, this, this whole slowdown moment, um, creating these from a month to month basis. And here's the reality that I need to announce to everybody. This is important. The Bond Book Club will return with Dr. No. So thanks to everybody out there. Thanks for everything going on. Everybody, this has been David Zaritsky and my incredible panelists, Thomas, Phil, and Simon. And we'll speak to you all real soon. Take care. <laughs>